Welcome to History Where It Happened. I'm your host, Dick Smith. In a few minutes, we're going to go to Fort Ticonderoga on location and talk about the role that Fort Ticonderoga had in events in Vermont history. The single most important event in Vermont history was the capture of Fort Ticonderoga in 1775 for America's first victory. Since 2015 is the 240th anniversary of Ethan Allen's capture of Fort Ticonderoga, May 10th, 1775. We thought you might be interested in seeing the Fort Ty episode again. But before we begin, I thought a little background would be helpful. April 19th, 1775, Lexington and Concord, the revolution was on. Within 10 days, a small group in Hartford, Connecticut, realized that in order to drive the British from Boston Harbor, they would need cannon. And they realized that they knew where cannon were. They were in Fort Ticonderoga, which had over 100 cannon. So around May 1st, a small group of about 16 people from Connecticut went west on what is now Route 44 now to western Connecticut to Salisbury and Canaan. Actually, in Salisbury, there were a lot of Allen family members, Ethan Allen family members, because he had actually started a furnace there. They then headed north from Sheffield to Great Barrington. In Great Barrington, the small group, one of them actually bought a jackknife at what is now called the Red Lion Inn. It's still in existence on Route 7. They continued up Route 7 through Stockbridge and Pittsfield. to Lanesboro, Williamstown, Pownall, and Bennington. In Bennington, this group, which is now about 50, they did recruit a few people from uh, Western Mass, about 50, they asked Ethan Allen to muster his Green Mountain Boys and capture Fort Ticonderoga. Of course, Ethan Allen said yes. So on May 5th, this contingent, this very small contingent, left Bennington and headed north. They went through Shaftesbury, they arrived, they actually went through Arlington, but in Arlington it was kind of interesting. One of the people from Connecticut and a lot of the people from Connecticut were actually unarmed going on this venture to capture a fort. He actually borrowed a gun in a bar in Arlington. They kept, continued on what is now the Shires Byway, Route 7A, to Manchester. In Manchester they recruited the largest immediate family with Ethan Allen at the capture of Fort Ty. That was the Roberts family, the father and the five sons. They then cut over what is now Route 30 through Dorset and Paulet. Went north through Wells and Pulteney. And they arrived and camped in Castleton. In Castleton, they had about 170 now. They were recruiting as they went along. And it's really amazing. Secrecy just can't be emphasized enough. They had 170 people with campfires and so on in Castleton, a town of only 200. And to keep this a secret from one of the uh, local people who might be a Tory, because at this time you really didn't know who favored the British, who favored the American cause, because the revolution had only been on for 10 days, two weeks. But he was able to keep it a secret. He then continued to recruit as he went north, Hubberton, Sunbury, Whiting, Shoreham, and finally at Hands Cove, and by the time he reached at Hands Cove, he had about 230 Green Mountain Boys plus um, the Connecticut and Massachusetts people. And he was able to keep that all a secret as he went from Bennington, which had about, left with about 50, maybe 60, to up to Hands Cove, 230. But on the morning of May 10th, 1775, he didn't have enough boats. He only had a boat that could make two trips, he only was able to bring 83 across Lake Champlain. In the morning, he captured Fort Ticonderoga with only 83 people, and that was America's first victory. As you watch this episode, be aware of some of the risks that Allen had. Some of the risks were obvious, some not so obvious. Some of the obvious risks were Fort Ticonderoga had 40-foot walls. The Green Mountain Boys didn't have any scaling equipment or art artillery to capture that would have been monumental task. The other thing too is they weren't sure if the fort knew they were coming. If somebody had gotten on their horse 
and warn Fort Ticonderoga. All the garrison had to do was close the door, arrange for buckshot, put it in the cannon. They could kill 15 to 20 people at one time. Some of the not so obvious risks that Allen had is the one involved him personally. He had a bounty on his head. He could have been executed. The governor of New York had put this bounty on him because he had been fighting New York for five years as part of the Green Mountain Boys. The other risk, too, was if the British had won the war, the king certainly wouldn't have sided with Allen and all his uh, land interests in Vermont. It would have sided with New York. So Allen had a lot of risks. Uh, I hope you enjoy this episode. Thank you very much. Welcome, I'm Dick Smith, and today we're going to visit spectacular Fort Ticonderoga here in New York. Now you're probably saying, why are we in New York to talk about Vermont history? Well, a lot of the events that happened in Fort Ticonderoga influenced the establishment of Vermont and the events in the North Shire and all of Bennington County. So come on, let's go down to visit the fort and we'll explain it. In 1609, the French explorer Samuel de Champlain came down from Canada, Canada's that way, that's north, came down to this very point. Of course, the fort wasn't here, but he came this far south. At the same time, in 1609, the explorer Henry Hudson came up the Hudson River as far as Albany. For the next 150 years, the French were claiming as far south as here, and the English were claiming down in the, uh, the coastal colonies, Connecticut, Massachusetts. This area was unsettled. This was disputed area. There was no specific boundary between the two, and that created tensions. In the east, it was also unsettled. That eastern area is now modern-day Vermont on the eastern side of Lake Champlain. That is modern-day Vermont. But we had tensions there now among the English colonies because in 1749, Benning Wentworth, the new governor of New Hampshire, decided based on his charter that he would charter, that he could charter towns 20 miles east of the Hudson River. Well, in 1749, he chartered the first town, Bennington, and then about 15 other towns up until uh, 1754. Of course, New York objected to that but not strenuously because it was paper towns. There were no settlements here. Well, after 150 years of tensions between the French in the north and the British in the south as to whose land this was in this vast, uh, undefined uh, no man's land between the French and the English, in 1754, hostilities broke out between the French and English, and that resulted in the beginning of the French and Indian War. <laughs> Now that hostilities had broken out into actual warfare, in 1755, the French decided they needed protection to keep the British who were in the south from coming up Lake George and Lake Champlain and going on to French Canada. So in 1755, they started construction of this fort. One of the features that was built into this fort by the French was a star-shaped design. And what that meant was that you could stand anywhere in the fort and get a good crossfire at any attacker trying to climb these walls. The walls themselves were part of the massive fort uh, defenses. Some of these walls are 40 feet high. The French truly thought this fort was impregnable. One of the biggest uh, defenses that this fort had were all these cannon. There were over 100 here. Some of these cannon could shoot a cannonball three miles. In other words, they could reach Lake Champlain from here, either to the north or to the south. But the big fear of these cannon for ground attackers was not cannonball, it was what's called grape shot, which is very similar to uh, shotgun shells, where they take a bag and put rocks in it, put, one, put a bag in here, shoot it, and it could wipe out, kill 15 to 20 attackers in one blast. In 1758, the British attacked Fort Carillon. With over 100 cannon, the French defenders were able to hold off 15,000 British attackers, even though they only had 4,000. But Jeffrey Amherst returned the next year and attacked, and he captured Fort Carillon. He changed the name to Fort Ticonderoga. 
He then marched north to Canada and captured Quebec in that same year, 1759. Basically, the war was over. The impregnable Fort Ticonderoga had fallen, it was in British hands, and the route to Canada was wide open. So in essence, in 1759, the French and Indian War was coming to an end. Now let's talk about Vermont and how Vermont fits into this picture. Well, when the French and Indian War was basically over in 1759, when Geoffrey Amherst captured Quebec, Benning Wentworth resumed the next year, 1760, to charter towns. He chartered one town, Pownall. The following year, he really went wild. He chartered 61 towns. And the reason it was because he said, now the French and Indian War is over. Fort Ticonderoga is under British control. There's no fear of French raids. The following year too, in 1762 and 1763, he chartered another 75 towns. But that's the reason a lot of the towns in the Greater North Shire have their charter date as 1761. Well, with all the chartering of these towns, New York was now starting to object because settlers were coming in. The New York governor was starting to send uh, sheriffs over to Vermont area to try and assert their land claims. But finally, in 1770, the settlers got really angry and decided to use force. And they turned to one of their own. And that was a settler from, who was born in Connecticut. His name was Ethan Allen. Ethan Allen formed the Green Mountain Boys. And for the next five years, the Green Mountain Boys roamed up and, up and down the west side of uh, Vermont, holding off New York's claims to the land. The Green Mountain Boys had become a paramilitary group. They'd sneak up on people at night and shout. They'd burn their houses and so on. They never killed anyone, but they came, became very organized in those five years when they were holding off New York's claims to what is now Vermont. April 19th, 1775, Lexington and Concord. The shot heard around the world. The revolution was on. The colonists were now fighting the British. But the colonists had a big disadvantage. They didn't have any heavy cannon. They knew where the cannon was. It was up in Fort Ticonderoga. So a small group from Connecticut left Hartford, went up the western uh, side of, of uh, Massachusetts, came up to Bennington and asked this man, a resident of Bennington, Vermont, Ethan Allen, to muster his Green Mountain Boys, who had become a paramilitary group, to go and capture Fort Ticonderoga. So Ethan Allen left with about 50 uh, Green Mountain Boys from Bennington, worked his way up Route 7 through the North Shire, went through uh, Shaftesbury, then he went to uh, Arlington, Sunderland, Manchester. In Manchester, he recruited the largest immediate family with him, the Roberts family. Then he cut over Route 30, which is Route 30 today, and came north to Hands Cove, which is just north of where the ferry um, comes across to Fort Ticonderoga. That's on the eastern shore of Lake Champlain. And by the time he got up there, he had about 230 Green Mountain Boys, plus some people from Connecticut and Massachusetts. Ethan Allen had crossed Lake Champlain from Hands Cove. He landed at Willows, Willows Point in New York. But he only had 83 people because he didn't have enough uh, boats. But at 4 a.m., he said there's not enough time. If, if I wait and get more people, the sun will be up. So he decided to attack. So led by Nathan Beeman, Nathan Beeman was a teenager who guided him across the fort, but Nathan Beeman's name is on the war memorial in Manchester. But those 83 snuck around the south side of the fort, came through this door. This door was actually in disrepair at the time. Climbed these stairs and then went into the fort. So follow me into the fort and we'll explain where he went from there. After Ethan Allen had come into the fort, he had knocked down a sentry. He came in here with his 83 Green Mountain Boys and a few people from Connecticut and Massachusetts into the main courtyard. It was here then, he didn't know where the commander was. But then he was told that the commander was up in the second floor, the door, the far door on the left. He knocks on the door and the British soldier says, under whose authority do you capture Fort Ticonderoga? And he says, 
he says, Ethan Allen says, many years later, in the name of the great Jehovah and the Continental Congress. Now some people say he said, come out you damn rat. But that's how it was. It was all over in about 10 minutes. From the time he entered the fort to the time the British surrendered. After Ethan Allen captured Fort Ticonderoga, that was a wonderful prize for the colonists. But more important were these cannons. They captured over 100 cannon. 59 of them were taken down Lake, uh, Lake Champlain, Lake George area, and across Massachusetts and put up over Boston Harbor. And on March 17th of the following year, the British looked up and here were these cannon, and they evacuated Boston Harbor. And it has always been celebrated, or not always, but frequently celebrated as Evacuation Day in Boston. And one of the great treasures here at Fort Ticonderoga is that they actually have two of the cannon that were captured by Ethan Allen and taken by Henry Knox down to the Boston area. And there's also a lot of other uh, very good treasures here, and it's in a museum that the fort has on the second floor of the uh, fort here. Fort Ticonderoga remained in American hands. But at the time, there was still a great fear that the British in Canada would come back down Lake Champlain and try and capture Fort Ticonderoga. So in 1776, the Americans built a big fortification over on Mount Independence, which is on the Vermont side of Lake Champlain. They built a footbridge across from Fort Ticonderoga to Mount Independence. And at its peak, there were about 15,000 Americans between Mount Independence and Fort Ticonderoga. The purpose of this, of course, is to prevent the British from coming south. And with Fort Ticonderoga in American hands, Mount Independence um, fortifications, the colonies thought they were safe, but they weren't. In 1777, the residents of the area known as the New Hampshire Grants, which is modern day Vermont, felt so confident because uh, Fort Ticonderoga was in American hands that on January 15th, 1777, they declared their independence over in Windsor on the uh, eastern part of Vermont. Well, they started then a, a convention, a constitutional convention to write a constitution and so on. At about that same time, a man named Johnny Burgoyne was going to the King of England and he had a plan. He would bring about eight, nine, 10,000 people down from Canada down uh, Lake Champlain, retake Fort Ticonderoga, and then move south down the Champlain Valley and Hudson River Valleys through Saratoga to Albany. That was his plan, to cut the colonies in half. But the plan eventually didn't work out that way. Well, the British did put Burgoyne's plan into uh, action. Burgoyne moves down Lake Champlain, and on July 6, uh, figures out a way to put a cannon up on Mount Defiance. He builds a road up there, and the 2,500 Americans were completely surprised. They never thought a cannon could get up there. So they make a decision. They evacuate Fort Ticonderoga. They cross the footbridge to Mount Independence, take the people there, and continue to Hubberton. From Hubberton, they go south through Manchester to Arlington, and then west to the uh, Saratoga area. The British chased uh, the Americans to Hubberton, and they also chased some down south down Lake Champlain to Whitehall, which is on the southern tip of Lake Champlain. On the following day, July 7th, a small group of British soldiers chased the Americans into what is now Vermont and caught up with them in Hubberton. Seth Warner and the Green Mountain Boys engaged them and had a rear guard action and stopped the British from chasing the main body. At the end of the battle, which basically, technically, the Americans lost, Seth Warner told the Green Mountain Boys, scatter and meet in Manchester. So the Green Mountain Boys went down to Manchester and started a camp down there. There was definitely panic in the colonies. Uh, the mighty Fort Ticonderoga had fallen on July 6th, July 7th, you had the Battle of Harberton. You had British in what is now Vermont. And word of the fall of Fort Ticonderoga and the Battle of Harberton reached Windsor, where there was a constitutional convention going on. The constitutional convention ratified the Vermont Constitution on July 8th, and that was the beginning of the 14 years of the Republic of Vermont. On July 8th, they adjourned quickly and raced down to Manchester. 
They had created a 12-person council of safety to govern Vermont. In Manchester, they met for the first time in the Marsh Tavern, which is now part of the Equinox Hotel. In the Marsh Tavern, Ira Allen, Ethan Allen's brother, sends a letter to New Hampshire requesting help. New Hampshire responds immediately, and within four weeks, General John Stark had come out of retirement and brought over a thousand New Hampshire militia into Manchester. In Manchester, he had a big choice. Do I go over to the Saratoga area and uh, help stop Burgoyne as he moves south? Or do I go down to Bennington? Because Bennington was the supply depot for the entire Northern Army. Well, General John Stark defied George Washington and went south to Bennington because Washington wanted him to come over to Saratoga. Down in uh, Bennington, Stark engages the British who were sending about a thousand Hessian troops to try and get the supplies there. It was a resounding victory, the Battle of Bennington. 700 were captured and brought right to the square right there by the old church. Another 200 were killed and about 50 wounded and only about 50 made it back to Burgoyne. Burgoyne two months later surrenders at the Battle of Saratoga without 15% of his best troops. He never got the supplies at um, at Bennington, and many people think that was the turning point of the war. The French, uh, the French entered on the American side, and many think that was the turning point of the war. And it's interesting, one of the cannon that was captured, the British brought uh, four cannons to Bennington. One of those four was the French-made cannon that was brought from Fort Ticonderoga, and that now is the Molly Stark cannon. One of the other cannon captured at the Battle of Bennington sits in the um, State House in Montpelier, and the other one is in the Bennington Museum. To end this episode, I thought it would be helpful to come back to the original spot where we started the episode, but now I think you might have a little more appreciation of what happened here. There's Fort Ticonderoga, and this is the spot where gentleman Johnny Burgoyne brought some cannon, put them up here, and when the Americans looked up, they said there's no way we can defend the fort. So they took off over that footbridge, which we talked about earlier, and went into Vermont. They eventually worked their way down through Rutland to Manchester, through Arlington, and then all the way over to the Saratoga area. Well, that's it. Thank you very much for joining us and hope to see you next time. <laughs>